I don't think the intro played. And we're live. <laughs> and oh. we're live, people. <laughs> that's the intro you're going to get this time. We don't have our professional here. <laughs> yeah, the the, yeah. Uh, the one that's actually trying to make money off of this thing. Yeah, just so, two amateurs. Exactly. Uh, Long-time viewers will notice that the uh, the normal host, our, uh, our beloved Caleb Brown, is not here. Mm -hmm. um, he has, after several months of me um, pleading with him to start reading uh, the subject of today's cast he uh punted um and said he wasn't going to do it unless he read an entire other book first and so i who had read said entire other book first decided that i would volunteer myself and so here we are so we are very grateful to have you i've been wanting to i've been wanting an excuse to read through this um and no better one than the podcast but i need a buddy to read it with me so so thank you for uh for making the sacrifice yes of we course. are going to be covering over the course of we'll see how many uh how many sessions it takes <laughs> over the uh, course of the next 10 years yeah god uh so this is this is jacques maritans i'd say his magnum opus uh the degrees mm -hmm. of knowledge published in 1932 it is thick it mm -hmm. is uh extensive it is translated from French, so it's going to take us a little while. We're, today, we're going to plan on doing chapter one, because I think both of us have read up into chapter two, and that's about it. Mm -hmm. We'll see how often we can put these out. I'm hoping weekly. We'll see uh, how uh, how conducive Jacques is to allowing that. Mm -hmm. but, yeah, there might uh, be stumbling blocks every now and then. <laughs> <laughs> there might be a chapter or two that we need to take several hours to discuss, so we'll see. Um mm -hmm. So, introductions. I am the anarcho Catholic, a uh, frequent guest of, on Ostrotomism. We've taken over Caleb's stream, or I guess I guess it's ours as well. We own it as much as he does, mm -hmm. despite despite the fact that we don't have any access unless he gives it to us. Yeah, we uh, don't receive royalties, but we're part of the crew. <laughs> you are Volgakov's behemoth. Yeah. Um, yeah. I guess anything you wanna you wanna add before we jump into it. Uh, not much. This was actually just to note that this was an, a midpoint in Maritain's career. He was, uh, I believe, 48 when he wrote it. You said it was published in 1930 30, 30 or 1932 originally. 32, then he'd be uh, 50, I believe. Yeah, he'd be exactly 50. It was exactly his 50th birthday. He had uh, 30 more years, 40 more years left in him. He died in 90. So this was pretty much a, a midpoint in his life. Uh, and he decided to write a big book on epistemology, sort of all of his learning on Thomism, mostly culmination of his career as, a, I suppose, a neo-Thomist might be uh, what you'd call him, or maybe just an old school Thomist uh, writing in a French style. But yeah, so uh, for, I don't really have anything I want to say before. I'm just, I show up on the show every now and then. If you know me, you know me. I've written a few articles. I promise I'm working on the other ones I promised before. And that's about it. <laughs> yeah, so on your note, so there's a, a note in the introduction by Ralph McInerney, I think, who was at uh, the Jacques Maritain Center at the University of Notre Dame, um, mentions that sort of when when this was published, it was recognized as like this is this is sort of the culmination of, of Maritain's thought and his work. And then he goes and writes 30 more books <laughs> <laughs> yeah. over the next 50 years or whatever it is. You'll um, notice that 20th century Thomists are very prolific. I think Favre Gahigou Lagrange wrote like 90 or 100 mm -hmm. or something like that. They're very prolific. The Brazilian Thomist and sp scholastic inspired, but very Thomist leaning philosopher Mario Ferreira de Santos wrote like 200, 150 or something like that. And a lot of them are like 20 volumes of an encyclopedia of philosophy and sciences. He literally has like a two volume treatise on economics as it happens, just like a by the by thing he did. So, yeah, uh, 20th century Thomas were very, very prolific. And Mahitan is absolutely no exception. So with that in mind, I want to talk a little bit about trying to read this because um, it's it's translated from the French. There's a there's a nice I've got the I think it's the translation of the third edition translation, something like that. There's a nice little forward by Maritain in here where he, he prolifically thanks the, the translators that he worked with, at, I think somewhere in Canada. I think it was at, let me confirm. Um, yeah, I have a third edition too. Just checked. So we have the same, uh, same edition, translation of the third edition. I don't know where the translators were from, but I know that at the time of writing the foreword, Mahitan was apparently in Princeton, New Jersey. Okay. That's, that's all I know because I have that opened up in my my yeah, well, legally oh. acquired PDF. <laughs> okay, yeah, it looks, it looks like the University of Toronto is where they were based. Oh, on. oh, that's um, where I was for like two years. Interesting. <laughs> I did not. That's actually that's the least. That I did not. I would not expect that. But their classics department 
is really good. That's oh, I should I this is part of my conversion or my reversion story was actually reading uh Saint Augustine, Peter Abelard, and uh what's the other one? What's the other Christian philosopher we read? Forget now, but it was mostly Saint Augustine and Peter Abelard that in the classics class, people you know who read who knew Latin really, really well were teaching it to us. So that was awesome. Like our professor knew Arabic and Latin and ancient Greek. That was awesome. And she wasn't a Christian at all, but she was very, very good. So I'm not I'm not surprised. They have a great classics apartment. That's fantastic. But yeah, anyway, so in the in the foreword here, when he's thanking his translators, he he has a sentence where he literally, and this is just so perfect, apologizes for his his like sort of verbose long prose. <laughs> and in it, he has a parenthetical about how obnoxious and long his parentheticals are and how they make the sentences drag on. <laughs> like he, he literally has a long drawn out sentence apologizing for long drawn out sentences and how they had to be broken up into shorter chunks for the English translation. Mm hmm. Yeah. Uh, so I, I know you, you've you've said you've read a lot of. Uh, is this sort of the continental style? Is it, would you would you call this a very continental style of writing? I'm starting to think it is. I mean, I've read other continentals like uh, Byung Chul Han recently, who doesn't have this long, very long winded style. His books are rather short. He kind of gets to the point. He writes like this, but more to the point. But like I'm recently reading Huel Beck, uh, for my first novel by Huel Beck, Serotonin, and he writes in long sentences with lots of comas. And he's a French novelist, but I've read a few other continentals and they drag on like this. And Hayek, most notably, if any econ nerds are reading this, he kind of writes like Hayek if Hayek had the sensibilities of a poet and not of a piece of drywall. <laughs> That's sort of how Maritain writes. And if you can imagine that, then, well, you know how he writes. Fair. To me, it just seemed incredibly <laughs> French. Like you'll have very, yes. very, you'll have very long strings of words that don't have a period that with without a period. And it's not necessarily a sentence because it just sort of goes on and on. It's, it's beautiful writing. I think he makes a point. This is, you know, it's, it, he's very precise in what he says, but he takes mm -hmm. his time to get there and he's, he's very willing to be flowery. Yeah. He can't, uh, this is not, I did the SAT. This is not what they suggest. This is not the style they suggest you use for the SAT essay. <laughs> <laughs> if, I, if I can put it like that, Americans may understand this. It's, you know, the advice I got was like, basically write your thesis at the start and, uh, then explain it, you know, punch your readers in the face, always make statements, you know, be very clear and direct. Uh, Maritan is clear, but uh, he's not direct. And his thesis is usually at the end of the paragraph. And it's something I find a lot, was, especially with, with 20th century writers, and, and I'm a lot earlier as well, but you don't really see it anymore, is there's this sort of baseline assumption of proficiency by the reader. <laughs> so he will be he will be happily to, happy to quote Augustine or... Um, I mean, plenty of biblical references or whoever, whatever philosopher. And just, oh yeah, like, you know, everyone knows who this is. I'm just going to drop the, the Latin in here, or drive, uh, you know, and, and make references to people that I've never heard of and have to go in and look up who he's talking about. Yeah, um, no. But it's just sort of assumed, of, yeah, of course, everyone mm -hmm. reading me will have done this. It's just, everyone's had their, their classical education and will know these things. There's possibly a joke. I don't know if it's a joke or a serious thing. If it's serious, it might be even funnier. And I, which, and I might consider other part of his works in light of us, but he has sort of a joke where he says Plotinus may have consorted with demons and you won't get this joke unless you understand Plotinus and the source we have in Plotinus, which is really funny. <laughs> he sort uh, of says like that. Uh, yeah. We'll get to this when we get to the chapter one. Cause I have this uh, probably uh, underlined at some point in some mm -hmm. point in my PDF, but yeah, it's, he sort of assumes some classical knowledge or, you know, you had, you know, enough Italian or something that you can read Latin, <laughs> but you can read the short Latin sentences he uses. <laughs> Okay. So um, I think you briefly mentioned it, but so the idea of degrees, degrees of knowledge, uh, Meriton is writing as a Thomist. I would call him a Thomist and not a Neo-Thomist. I think he really very much is is inspired directly by by St. Thomas. Yes. Um, and, um, it's really the style that throws you off of just using that label directly more than anything. Because he does agree. not write like St. Thomas. He kind of Would writes he... like St. Augustine more than anything if I had to compare him to a, a, an early Catholic philosopher. But yeah. I can see that, but yeah, but but his but his philosophy is very very uh, scholastic. It is very yes, much it um, is totally scholastic. Optimistic. And he in chapter one before he gets into any of the epistemology before he makes any real statements or arguments, he kind of already assumes you're familiar with like uh you know the argument for motion at the very least because <laughs> he sort of makes a, a very passing reference to the prime mover who and he sort of has a whole 
he ha- he ha- outlines a chain of actions that without the prime mover can't be possible in any point in time. You know, the artist with the pen who's writing on the piece of paper. And before that, there's the will and for before the will versus the first mover. And if y- you don't get that, that's basically the argument for motion. Uh, well, uh, good luck <laughs> reading this book, basically. <laughs> right. So anyway, so he is using Thomism to try and, and delve into epistemology. Um, in particular, and I think we'll probably get into this as we go along, he, he is very focused on the epistemology as relevant for, you know, a 20th, 20th century man of science or man of letters. At this point, we have, you know, the, the science is sort of wholly changed mm-hmm. from St. Thomas's time. Um, I would say starting with, with Descartes, you really sort of see this, but you have, you've already had Newton, you've had Maxwell, um, you would have had Einstein at this point. Maritain mm-hmm. is... Uh, from what I've understood, has done a, does a very good job of sort of staying on top of the latest scientific trends and understanding the revolutions that are happening in science, mm-hmm. and really wants to make sure these are put on firm um, philosophical foundations. And yes. I think, uh, and I know one of the big things that I try and focus on is how is how poorly science has done that, how much it has sort of lost its way. Yeah, and, and Meredith is one of the first people that I read, that, or the, one of the early people that really sort of realized where things had taken a wrong turn. And so I think a lot mm-hmm. of this is he's trying to lay out, this is what we know, this is how we know, and this is the proper way to understand first, and in the first part of his book, the sensible world and, and material things. And then in the second part of his book, he actually goes into, into more mystical um, kinds of knowing. Mm-hmm. Which we get a, a big preview in chapter one. <laughs> he really uh, goes into that. Yeah, so go, let's let's go ahead and start on chapter one then. So this is the, the majesty and poverty of metaphysics, which is a fantastic yes. title. <clears throat> yes, uh, it is. Let me uh, go. But I, I should probably read the, the not the first paragraph. There's a specific part in it. No, no, maybe the first paragraph because it's short. Go for <clears throat> it. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> in periods when shallow speculation is rife, one might think that metaphysics would shine forth at least by the brilliance of its modest reserve. But the very age that is unaware of the majesty of metaphysics likewise overlooks its poverty. Its majesty, it is wisdom. Its poverty, it is human science. It names God, yes, but not by his own name. For it is not possible to paint a picture of God as it is to draw a tree or a conic section. You, true God, the savior of Israel, are veritably a hidden God. When Jacob asked the angel early in the morning, tell me, what is your name? He replied, why do you ask my name? It is impossible to utter this truly wondrous name, the name that is said above every name that is named either in the present world or in the world to come. So that sets the tone for pretty much everything that follows. This is not a, uh, if you read Phaser, a lot of Phaser's work is uh, quote unquote secular. You can read this as like a, a Jew, uh, you know, a secular theist in the sense that you don't have a religion, but you believe in a prime mover like Aristotle or something like that. You very much can't do that with Maritan. Maritan will start this off by quoting scripture at you. And it's just, yeah, this is assumed true. We might argue for this later on, but yeah, this is, this is our starting point. This is where we get our stuff. And he goes on later into the chat, into chapter one, explaining basically how revelation can work in personal life, especially the life of the saint, but how that's different from the object proper of metaphysics. It's not the uniting of the will of God, the metaphysics seek by uniting of the intellect. And it's a very, it's not knowledge through love like the saint has that cannot really be uttered and set down in words. And but yeah, I that's how we begin. Right. And I think, <clears throat> and it's, I don't think I appreciated it on first reading, but when you get to the end of the chapter, I mean, that it, it, he really summarizes what he is he is trying to accomplish in this first chapter, mm-hmm. is that there is there is something that, and I, I don't know if if he had said this, but I, but metaphysics really is sort of the highest of the natural sciences. It has it has the highest end of the natural sciences. It is it is the it is the attempt to understand being as being through the use of the intellect. Right. You, you, mm-hmm. There's 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 nothing higher you can pursue through through purely natural means, and in that way, it is it is the greatest of the natural sciences. It's it's below theology because it lacks revelation and and, and lacks um, yeah lacks revelation. Mm-hmm. But still, among among what you can do from a purely per, uh, secular perspective, it's it is the 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 pinnacle of what we what we'd understand today as science, um, and yet it is it is ultimately doomed to fail on its own terms. Because it, as, as much as it tries to 
to understand God. And, and I think the, the tools of natural theology, one of my biggest eye-opening moments is, was when I started reading St. Thomas and realizing how much of, of what he does requires no revelation, requires no teaching of the church. It is, here's what we understand of the world, and here's what we can say about God because of it. Mm -hmm. and yeah, it is, that it was is, Peter Abelard and St. Augustine for me, really. Mm -hmm. Which is surprising coming from Augustine, but yeah, he really does a good job in philosophical <laughs> explanations. What can I say? But then there's a, you will necessarily, if you're if this is your approach, you will necessarily reach a limit far short of your goal because you are never yes. going to intellectually attain the divine. Yes, and he goes he goes hard at this in chapter one. He makes sure like uh, this is true because I I forget there I've heard certainly a Christian uh, heresy that uh, very much seeks this goal of intellectual uh, unity with a divine in this life. I've been almost, I mean, there's all kinds of heresy, so I can just say something and say that, that at some point that was a Christian heresy. But I'm pretty sure this did exist in the early church, and the early church had to fight it. But uh, he very he insists on the, you're not going to get a god. Even when you understand that god is wisdom, is truth, is goodness in itself, you won't really get that unity until the beatific vision you won't understand it or unite your intellect with it fully you can't you can only sort of point at it vaguely right and i think it's for i would say as moderns as we try and go back and read someone like saint thomas and and i know i i certainly can fall into this is appreciating just how much the intellect can tell us that is true mm -hmm. about things that you're you know there, there's and he gets into this sort of the end of chapter one is we sort of created this divide in the modern world between here's the physical things that the intellect can know and here's the spiritual things that are all woo woo and and um not connected to the intelligible world and that was certainly never how the the church up until you know the 17th 18th century understood things is there was mm -hmm. the the intellect could contact the spiritual mm -hmm. and sort of rediscovering this what you want to say is oh my god we can do so much with this how far can we go and it's mm -hmm. really important to sort of get smacked back down and say, okay, this is important and good that you do this, but but and especially limits. because because of our, of our natural uh, faculties, the intellect is is the highest thing in man. Yeah. If you if you only consider our, our 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 human nature, but that's not enough to to get to God. You need you need grace. You need the you need divine inspiration. You need the the contact with. Yes. You need you need the the saving grace of of the cross. Yeah, grace is very much present in Maritain's works in the sense that he will talk about it in depth. Uh, you won't get this really with a lot of uh, Catholic uh, and then modern theologians, which are not clergy members like uh, Faser and Oderberg, which are usually my go to for Catholic perspectives on uh, moral issues in epistemology and metaphysics. You, they don't really talk about grace that much because that's really, they leave that to the clergy, but they will essentially make apologia from a, a natural law point of view and a natural, uh, you know, a natural secular perspective on this, but they'll stay away from grace. Mahatan has absolutely no such, uh, no such limit, no such reluctancy to talk deeply about the lives of saints, like really deeply. Do you, do you want to go into that some? Because I know he... I think it's a probably a good time to go and jump into that if you if you'd like it or if you want to talk. About yeah, but just yeah. before this, I'll just say what he sets out as the second paragraph. I'm not going to read all of it. I'm just going to point out what he thinks is the problem with uh, modern metaphysics from the you know, and he lines up a bunch of examples here. So the neo Kantians, neo positivists, idealists, Bergsonians, logisticians, prag pragmatists, neo Spinozists, or neo mystics, and they all have the ancient error of nominalism. And I'm just going to read a bit of this, uh, the end of the second of the third paragraph here. But why this incurable nominalism? The reason is that while having a taste for the real indeed, they nevertheless, nevertheless have no sense of being. Being as such, loose from the mat matter in which it is incorporated. Being with its pure objective necessities and its laws that prove no burden, its restraints which do not bind, its invisible evidence is for them only a word. So that's uh, what he sets out as sort of uh, the problem with modern metaphysicians. And, and am I am I correct in, in remembering he was he either was a Bergsonian or he studied under Bergson? Is that yes? Right? He became he became interested in metaphysics because of Bergson. He realized its limits when he met his wife, and they vowed that if they didn't find a meaning to life in like a year or something, they would kill themselves. 
uh, and then they became Catholic, luckily. But yeah, <laughs> that was <laughs> so. Yeah, he he actually has quite a quite a big affection for Bergson. I think Bergson eventually converted, which he mentions in uh, Ways of Knowing God. Uh, I believe he mentions that Bergson or one of his early mentors did actually convert, and he mentions as a way, which is the witness of people of the faith, is actually a way of knowing God, just seeing people who live the faith, which again plays into his whole um, theme, really, which is throughout basically every book I've read of sainthood, essentially. Peter Kreef sort, sort of mentions this every now and then, but you know, to attain perfect knowledge, sanctity is necessary. That's just like obvious if you understand what sanctity is i think mahitan very much understood that mm -hmm. and then he has a goes on a long diatribe about the, the poet and the and the metaphor and the metaphysician which my sticky note just like says yeah he just if you if you want to read about the poet sort of delves into sensible things and glimpses god that way and the the metaphysician goes into sensible things and then retreats and abstracts from them to find the light of God, which shines on all of them. That's essentially, I've summarized the entirety of the third paragraph there after that, <laughs> which is a very long paragraph of a lot of beautiful, beautiful run on sentences. I mean, just, you know, for man has many sleeps every morning. He wakes from animal slumber. He emerges from his human slumber when intelligence is turned loose and from a sleepy unconsciousness of God when touched by God. He has sentences like that. That was just a random sentence I picked off in the middle of this page. I didn't even look at it to see what it said beforehand. And, and it was going, it was going like to that. be gold. And yeah, I, I, there's, there's really a good appreciation, I think, for the, for the metaphysician as a, as a scientist, as a man of science. And I think that's something that we have, we have lost a little bit, but that he is really trying to start from, if he's doing metaphysics well, is he is starting from first things and he is, he is building, you know, it's, it's analogous to how you would imagine a modern mathematician trying to derive a, a proof or a, um, a, a physicist trying to, trying to understand the cosmos is the, the work of the metaphysician is very much a rigorous academic science um, mm -hmm. as it should be. But again, this, this, this necessarily is what limits it. This is what keeps it from, from achieving what it can achieve. Because if you're working as a scientist, you are not working as a saint. I mean, you can certainly be a scientist and a saint, but there is, th these are sort of two different realms two different where either hats, you are, so you are deriving, go ahead. You two different hats. When you're wearing your scientist hat, you're not uh, speaking as the saint necessarily. And there's there's no there's no room um, in the science per se for sanctifying Sanctum. grace yes. for for um, for charity for the the um, divine virtues. There is you know there's there's the the algorithmic there's the formulaic there's the 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 process of of mm -hmm. doing science. Yes. Yes. And after that, he goes on in the long diatribe that it can also sum up as basically he's facing the objection of, you know, the modern mind is not suited to metaphysics. And of course, he begins this with an imaginary dialogue <laughs> where he also delves into poetry. But <laughs> I'll leave that to the side unless you want me to read it. But uh, yeah, he goes into this and he says, look, the modern, it's true, the modern mind has fallen out of favor of metaphysics, but you know, I'll just quote this, habits can be corrected. <laughs> That's basically the summary. <laughs> the intellect has not changed in nature. It has acquired habits and habits can be corrected. Second nature, but the first nature is always there and the syllogism will last as long as man does. That's the summary of that, yep. of that part. And it's, it's there's a, I think, a, a, and I don't, I can't remember if he makes this connection or not, but a connection with the church as well is that the, you know, the church is, is really never in favor with the, with the, with the current world. And mm -hmm. I but it is also timeless. It is also for, for everyone, for all oh, time. Yeah. He gets into that by the end of the, of this chapter where he says it's for everyone. It's a universal thing. And he's really has a very prescient thing where I think we're a, a very prescient observation where he mentions that he thinks the Catholicity or, or to translate that, the universal aspect of a church will get more revealed in the 20th century than before, where he cites as an example, you know, this group of Indian monks that sort of, uh, you know, take some literary inspiration from the Vedantas, but are purely Thomists in their metaphysical understanding of the world. And they sort of built this very Indian way of writing and thinking, but it's, you know, thoroughly Catholic. Mm -hmm. And he sort of praises that as, and he sort of has also the intuition, which I think is increasingly proven to be correct, that the clergy or the ecclesial 
part of a church in every nation will become more will be uh, composed more and more by members of that nation instead of you know missionaries from Europe or North America or something like that which I think is pro proving to be true and uh, I I think a boon of a church if you just look at Cardinal Lorenzo and Cardinal Sarah Absolutely. Do you, do you mind if we skip ahead to the, and, and touch on that briefly? Because I, I love his comment on, on Belloc's quote. Oh, sure. I just, just let me find it, if, unless you have it. Yeah. You know, so I'm, 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 so the, the, the Belloc, um, I think this is a direct quote, but is the um, Europe is the faith and the faith is Europe. Yes. And then he goes on how that, that's both true and not true, depending on how you look at it. Yeah. Let me and, see and if so, I can find it. It's, it's on about, about the last yeah, page of the chapter. Yeah. Yeah. I find it. It's on page 17. So it's near uh, the end of a chapter. So I can just read this, uh, this or this part of the paragraph at least. If Hilaire Belloc means that Europe would be nothing without the faith and that its very reason for being has been and still is to dispense faith to the world, he is right in saying that Europe is the faith. But absolutely speaking, no, Europe is not the faith and the faith is not Europe. Europe is not the church and the church is not Europe. Rome is not the capital of the Latin world Rome is the capital of the world. Urbs caputud caput orbis. So I believe urbs, yeah, but the head of the uh, head of the orb or head of the or something around which everything spins. That's how I would translate urbs caput orbis. The church is universal because it is born of God. All nations are at home in it. Their master's arm on the cross are stretched out over all races and all civilizations. It does not bring the benefits of civilization to people, but rather Christ's blood and the supernatural beatitude. It seems that a kind of wondrous epiphany of its Catholicity is being readied in our times, and the steady growth in missionary countries of the native clergy and the native episcopacy will be considered can be considered a prophetic sign of it. And so I'll just quote. I'll just also quote the little uh, the what I mentioned about the Indian monks. Uh, the great plan of uh, Brahmanandav, taken up once more by his disciple Animananda, is not the plan of a European, but of a Bengali. The plan was to establish in Bengal a contemplative congregation whose members, religious mendicant on the order of the Hindu Sanayis, would set for the whole of India an Indian example of Catholic holiness, and without overlooking the, v the Vedanta, would base its intellectual life on the doctrines of Thomas Aquinas. I cherish this tribute to the strength of Thomism, though a gift made to the whole world by medieval Christianity, it neither belongs to one continent nor to one century. It is universal, as is the church and truth. Beautiful. Yep. <laughs> yeah, he has a gift for just writing very beautifully. He could have just been a poet and never written philosophy, and he would be very well remembered for that. Mm-hmm. Yes, yeah, so, and and to to sort of summarize and get back a little bit on on the the original original point is there is this this universal in this case like, um, um, universal in terms of over over the whole world now, but also this mm -hmm. this permanence of the church that you know like very much the sort of implication is the the West can fall, the West can can um, uh, lose its way, and the church will be just fine. The church is yeah. the church. The church is eternal. The church the church is you know, we'll, we'll do its best to sort of save the remnants of Western civilization decides to end itself. But that's, that's not really the mission of the church. The church is not there to keep the West from, from eating itself. The church is there for the salvation of souls and to, mm -hmm. and to elevate what can be elevated. He also brings up a very good point that I see a lot of Catholics getting caught up in a debate with Protestants or atheists on, on Twitter, at least. Um, that is, the church does not bring the benefits of civilization to people. Uh, and I think a lot of Catholics sort of get stuck on this where, uh, people say, look, I understand that Catholicism, you know, I understand you never resolve these apologetics, apologetics or whatever, but you know, um, Africa, the parts of Africa, Africa that are Catholic are still poor or st stuff like that, you know, uh, or even in, uh, you know, can't countries or areas which are highly Catholic, there's still all this bad stuff for still all this undesirable stuff from a civilizational perspective. And, you know, that's not, that doesn't appeal to me. So there's something wrong with it. And we sort of go back and forth with the Protestants. It's like, look what Protestantism has led to. It's led to, you know, Drag Queen Story Hour or whatever. And that's a direct result of Calvin and Luther and so on. You know, we get, we get into all these arguments on Twitter. But Maritan very calmly says, uh, that's not the point. You're missing all of it. Get, mm -hmm. get out of this discussion. It does not bring the benefits of civilization to people. There, I've sidestepped the argument. 
but rather Christ's blood and supernatural beatitude. Done. That's way higher than the benefits of civilization. That's all you need. Yeah, and I think, especially, you know, sort of uh, being at least adjacent to a bunch of libertarian circles, you see these very utilitarian arguments. Is, okay, yes. well, is, what, what is the, what is, what, what good does this produce? You know, okay, is it, is it raising the per capita income? Is it, is it civilizing people? Is it, you know, getting rid of hunger? And I mean, to be fair, the church has done those things. You know, he, mm -hmm. there, he mentions, you know, the, the one place, the, the church sort of raised up the one place where reason almost succeeded, I think is the quote that he had, mm -hmm. that being, that being Europe and the, you know. Yeah. Yeah. That's a beautiful quote too. The one place where reason almost succeeded. <laughs> <laughs> But you can see, okay, like you know, there, there are there are tangible benefits to to the church and what it does for the world, but it's completely secondary to its yeah. mission. As it's it's sort of an extra thing, and if it happens, great. If it doesn't, that's not what the church is there for. The church is not there to to make people rich or to make to raise people out of poverty. It's there to 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 provide supernatural beatitude, as he says. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there is a you know there is sort of a utilitarian apologetic, which because I know some people who have essentially uh, you know found out through natural law, you know, reason for natural law and basically arrive at the same conclusions of a church and then found the church e interesting for that and eventually, uh, you know, believe in the re resurrection of Christ and the claim of the church. One such example is a sort of semi-libertarian figure, which I quite admire on Twitter, at Morlock P or uh, Travis Cork, Cork Cochran. I believe he's in the, the New Hampshire Congress now, by the way. Uh, he's an interesting guy. I've mentioned him before on the show because he's also a hobo farmer, as he describes himself. But he sort of mentions this, that a lot of the uh, social code that he sort of worked out, because he's a, this very big nerd, game theory and stat nerd, a lot of the social code that he worked out that is kind of required for civilization was worked out millennia before by the Catholic Church. And the more and he investigates it, the more true it is. And the older he gets, the more it seems obvious that like this is just true. So there is sort of an apologetic in that sense. But yes, um, you know, a lot of the social code that we get may have been, you know, divinely revealed or, you know, divinely inspired in the mind of church fathers or people like that. But uh, that's ultimately not the point of the church. Ultimately, the point of the church is to spread the gospel of our Lord and Savior. And that's what the church sticks to. Everything else is secondary and is secondary in the sense that, you know, after you've gotten the good news, you know, maybe you should unite your your habits and your will to Christ. And that does require good habits. Yeah, and, I, I, and if the if the ultimate ultimate goal of the church is truth and truth himself, mm -hmm. you expect a, a people that are that that are more united to truth are going to live lives that are more united to truth, and will be more will be able to to live life and life abundantly, right? Like, yes. it, is, it is not it's not coincidence that the the church can also bring affluence and civilization. It's just secondary. It's a, it's a, it's a natural um byproduct of yeah that's a good way truth. to put it not coincidence but secondary mm -hmm. it can or cannot happen it's actually it's also not a necessary effect of church evangelization you know it can happen that uh you know you convince a lot of uh very well-meaning but stupid people that uh you know the, the gospel of jesus christ is true but you know there's no capital investment and so they remain poor. Like, okay, that's that's fine. <laughs> you you save their souls. It's fine if they don't increase capital per person or whatever. Right. Capital per capita. It's it's okay. I don't care about their production function. Such a terrible libertarian. What? How dare you? Um. So <laughs> <a> good Austrian. <laughs> there you go. So yeah. So um, back with I guess where we were previously. Sorry mm -hmm. for jumping around. Let me scroll up. But yeah, no, that's a very good point. Uh, da, 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 da. we can skip a bit of the joys of a fire. Da, 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 da. What's my next outline? Uh, that is awakened. Okay, the poverty. Okay, so I'm on page uh, seven here. My next outline after that whole stuff, he talks about you know, I've already mentioned uh, mystical possession. He talks a bit about mystical possession of the eternal love of the most holy God. Oh, yeah, this is a great quote, but I forgot to outline it's just before this, but it's really, really good. It is inevitable, then, unless some inhuman deviation intervene, that intellectual life, as it is in us, must finally admit its poverty. So that is what you mentioned before, but it has limits. And 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 uh, one day, pour itself out in desire. It is the problem of Foss. If human wisdom does not spill upwards into the possession 
upwards into the love of God, it will fa fall downwards towards Marguerite, false love interest. Mystical possession and eternal love of the most holy God or physical possession in the fleetingness of time of a poor fleshly creature. For great, as w great wizard as one may be, that is where it all ends up. There lies the choice that cannot be avoided. So that's how he ends up of a fifth point because he doesn't go by paragraphs, but he has like points. So he's like 1.1, mm -hmm. 1 .1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3. So there ends up point 0.5 or part five of the first chapter. And, and so for the for, again, there's there's an assumption of some of some literacy among the readers, but this is a reference to to Goethe's Damnation of Faust, uh, or is it just is it Damnation of Faust the opera and Faust is the book? I can't remember. Uh, Anyways, but Goethe, the, Goethe actually changes. That's uh, Christopher Marlowe damns Faust, but Goethe has a uh, Faust be saved at the last minute and ascend to heaven through divine intervention, of course. That's right. So he, do you, do you wanna, he himself do you wanna... screwed his own soul. <laughs> but God kind of pulled him out of his mess because God's love is infinite. Do you, do, do you, do you want to really briefly just sort of summarize uh, as much as you can the, the story of Faust? Okay, I can give the basics outline because I haven't read Gutta's Faust. I just read the Wikipedia page a while ago. Even though sure. I have the PDF, I should read it. But uh, basically, um, I believe the purpose of Faust is to either gain immortality or to enjoy all the earthly pleasures in the world. Essentially, he has this grand high aim, it, but it's a very worldly aim. And in Goethe, one of his aims is to possess Marguerite, uh, which I believe is his maid, but it's his love interest. Simple Marguerite, who I believe is quite pious. So there's a bit of a corruption story there as well. And uh, to do this, he makes a deal with the devil, Mephistopheles. And uh, Goethe's Faust is actually really good on this because it says Mephistopheles describes himself as the spirit which negates it is a spirit of negation. It says no to everything that exists. It wants to wipe out everything from Earth. So it's very, it's very much an incarnation of evil as nothing. Mm -hmm. Ari Lafferty also touches on this point. I've showed this book before. I'll show it, show it again. Read Past Master, <laughs> where the devil is basically a great nothing. But it's really, really good. Uh, so that's the basic story. It's a man who sort of sells his soul to a devil or the devil, possibly. I would I would lean on the interpretation of the devil for Catholics, since it is the spirit of negation, um, or maybe even something higher than the devil. It's that which the devil uh, instantiates, maybe. But he makes a deal of that, sells his soul, and at the end of three days, essentially, where he enjoys all these earthly pleasures and sees all these sights, if if a certain thing doesn't happen. His sort of he goes to hell in uh christopher marlowe's version dr faustus uh Faust is screwed and it's a you know a lesson for don't make a deal of the devil uh in Goethe's version it's sort of a lesson of a divine mercy that even if you do make a deal of the devil still stretch your arms out to god that's a gut that's Goethe's idea but yeah very much Goethe actually makes even more impactful what mariton is saying that you know it's either you go to the eternal love of the most holy god or of a poor fleshly creature in the fleetingness of time. There is no other choice. And the and the the limitations of the intellect, because in, in various versions of Faust, you know, he he comes to know all things. Like he yes, he, he obtains yes. perfect knowledge. And... Yeah, he doesn't have only one lofty goal. You're right. He wants perfect knowledge. He wants like to see all these sights. He wants possibly immortal life. He wants so on and so forth. He sort of gives into sort of it's sort of a play on the temptations of Christ by the devil. He sort of gives it gives into every single temptation. <laughs> Those are his high aims. That's actually a really good play. I only noticed as I said it. But yeah, it's basically the devil tempts Christ and Christ says yes to every single temptation. That, <laughs> that's Faust. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's that's basically Faust. What what's the type of soul that would say yes to every single temptation and say this is not enough? I need more and more and more. Because some you know souls would just say, Yeah, I want infinite bread. That's okay. I just want food, or I just want to know everything, or I just want to rule everything, or I want to be the most glorious. And you know, they'd stop at these different levels, but Faust goes on and up and up and up and sees that this is all not enough. That's sort of a lesson of a, of the play, or I don't know if other versions are an opera or a book, but that's sort of a, the lesson of Marlowe's and got this thought Faust. Mm -hmm. And 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 to to the connection to metaphysics is that is there's this 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 poverty of metaphysics again that that Meredith yes. is pointing to that even with all the human knowledge he's still damned if it's not if that knowledge is not directed mm -hmm. towards the love of God. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, that is then the poverty of metaphysics, and yet its majesty too. It awakens a desire for supreme union. 
for spiritual possession completed in the order of reality itself and not only in the concept. It cannot satisfy that desire. And now I'll just read this and then we can comment. We preach a different wisdom, scandal for the Jews, madness for the Greeks. This wisdom, far surpassing all human effort, a gift of deifying grace and free endowments of uncreated wisdom, all capitalized, has as its beginning the mad love that wisdom itself has for each and all of us, and as its end, the union of spirit with it. Only Jesus crucified gives access to it, the mediator raised up between heaven and earth. When Al-Halaj, his hands and feet cut off and crucified on the gibbet like him, capitalized, was asked, what is mysticism? He replied, you see here its lowest stage and its highest level. You cannot gain entrance to it. And yet tomorrow you will see what it will become, for it is the divine mystery wherein it exists that I bear witness to it and that it remains hidden to you. Mystical wisdom is not beatitude the perfect spiritual possession of divine reality. But it is a beginning of it. It is an entering into incomprehensible life, even here below, a taste, a touch, a sweetness of God that will not pass away, for the seven gifts will continue in vision what they here begin in faith. So aside from the, the beauty of it, there's actually quite a bit to comment on. <laughs> yeah, and it's um, going back a, a little bit, when, and I think you touched on this briefly, he sort of talks about how, how metaphysics is an end in itself. And I don't mm -hmm. know if he's already had the quote at this point, but there's it, you don't do metaphysics like we were talking about. You know, the, the goal of the church is not is not the the improving of of physical conditions. The goal of metaphysics is not understanding of the physical world. That you don't you don't do metaphysics so that you mm -hmm. can, you know, have more food to eat. You don't do it so that you can run a more cohesive government. You don't do it for X or Y. You, you do it for its own end. It is you do it to know. And to know mm -hmm. the, the highest things. There's a few quotes on that I can read. Metaphysics demands a certain purification of the intellect. It also takes for granted a certain purification of the will. And assumes that one has the courage to cling to things that have no use. To useless truth. However, nothing is more necessary to man than this uselessness. What we need is not truths that serve us, but a truth we may serve. And I'm going to skip a bit. Indeed, what does it profit to gain the whole world and lose the integrity of reason? And then finally, where he ends the section, metaphysics is not a means. It is an end, a fruit, a good at one's self justifying and delightful, a knowledge for the free man, the freest and naturally most regal knowledge, the door to the leisure of that great speculative activity in which intellect alone can breathe, set as it is on the very peak of causes. And this is the the great um, apologetic act of metaphysics, because if you if you if you if you reach these sorts of heights of metaphysics, you realize how much more there is to try and grasp, and you yes. and you and you realize the hopelessness of it. Yeah, and he, it, and, 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 it, and it really it really mm -hmm. it really calls for a supernatural wisdom. Yeah, and metaphysics so you, you awakens despair. a desire for supreme mm -hmm. union. It mm -hmm. very much uh, underlying awakens the desire. It cannot fulfill it. And I, and I think the in the in the sort of proper ordering of of the the intellect and of and of man, the that longing that that desire that gets awakened then gets fulfilled in in the church is that you, mm -hmm. you you have this reason to to approach that that wisdom that that um surpasses human effort as he says yeah to, to seek a, out deifying grace mm -hmm. no, and he you know i sort of i get this more or i understand it more when a philosopher instead of a, a clergyman says it but when you know because when a philosopher talks about wisdom for some reason the connotation is different from when a when you know a priest or church fathers talk about wisdom because the church father obviously means christ when he capitalizes wisdom or he obviously means god uh instead of just the second person of the trinity but here he very much is you know as a philosopher saying no that wisdom which we also seek as philosophers as even you know laying aside the church we go to every sunday is the the very root of um this wisdom that surpasses all human effort is the mad love that wisdom itself has for each and all of us and its end so wisdom has a has an actual end it, it is an operative force on the world the union of spirit with us 
And I think, and and just to to get ahead a little bit, and, and also sort of to lay some more uh, some metaphysics background, mm-hmm. is there there's a the one of the the um, oh, what is the term uh, the transcendentals? Yes, um, the free transcendentals: beauty, truth, and goodness. Right. So that that that's uh, truth being one of the transcendentals, and this I, I think it's Aquinas's fifth proof. That God is is intellect. Uh, it's, either, it's either the fourth or the fifth. Where, where he, I think it's the fifth. Um, that that God is, you know, capital W wisdom. That he is that he is knowledge of itself um, and of the world and in its in its perfect form. And that um, by participating, say, in metaphysics, we are we are partaking of Him in that in that fundamental way. Um, mm-hmm. And again, that that we we can't we can't cross that chasm to Him on our own. Um, he has to he has to come down to us in a very very real and a, and a metaphorical way. Yeah, of course, uh, in meta in this sort of metaphysics as well, everything you do as long as it's not a privation is a participation in God. But one of the highest you can do outside of the sacraments is the life of contemplation. Yes. I mean that is an end for that's why the life of contemplation is the ob- object for monk or for monks for a monastic orders. It's very much the life of contemplation that even aristotle himself preached i mean that's aristotle so regard so highly regarded the contemplative life that he thought the, the prime mover would contemplate itself just because of how glorious it is mm-hmm. it wouldn't actually operate in the world aside from you know moving it at every instance in the problem of change and so on but it wouldn't you know for aristotle deliver sacraments or have saving grace it would contemplate itself because it doesn't why would it why would it contemplate the world <laughs> And so yeah, that's I, what we would aspire to. We would aspire to join the prime mover in that contemplation. Mm-hmm. And that's, I guess, that's the, the sort of transition from Aristotle to, to St. Thomas, who, of course, um, borrowed heavily from Aristotelian thought. As Aristotle he baptized had the, the Greek, so to say. <laughs> right. Um, the, 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 the highest, the, you know, the, the best use of your time was spending contemplation. And for St. Thomas, the best of your time was in contemplation of the divine, was in, was in the, the contemplation of, of, um, of what is. Or who who is I guess or who am, mm-hmm. and actually just talking sticking to Aristotle for a bit and bringing it to Myriton, I recently discovered, uh, or I may be wrong, but I believe it's correct. That, you know, one of Aristotle's main uh, uh, occupations was as a biologist, specifically a marine biologist. If you read his treaties on animals, he was one of he was literally the first person to discover how octopi reproduce and actually play it down reg. It, it everyone was impressed when in like the 19th century we finally confirmed it for ourselves because before then we thought our soul was just sort of kicking that you know one of the one of the tentacles is actually the equivalent of a male gland and then they would detach it and give it to a female and the female would impregnate itself everyone thought no that there's no way that's real just so happens yeah that that's how most octopi reproduce but uh a lot of his work is it was in sensible things and then from Observing them, he realized he needed a way to categorize and think about them. So he sort of invented Aristotelian logic for that sense. And then from that on, he abstracted higher and higher to metaphysics from working in the sensible order. And that's sort of how Mariton describes it as well. You begin with a sensible order, and then you sort of retreat from it in a sense without letting go of it. But you abstract from it what must be happening in a deeper, more fundamental way. Right. And this is going to be the progression of the book as we get into the meat of it, is it's going to start with with a knowledge of the sensible and then how we abstract that to um, uh, things like, you know, um, philosophy or, or um, scientific knowledge and then abstracting that further to metaphysical knowledge and then crossing the gap into into mystical knowledge. But the, mm-hmm. the and as you said, I think Aristotle considered himself uh, first and foremost a biologist. The fact that he's sort of the one of the great philosophers mm-hmm. of all time was sort of secondary in his mind to the great work he did in biology. Of all things. <laughs> yeah, which is really funny to think about. The greatest philosopher of all time is just, you know, I'm really proud of my marine samples, everyone. <laughs> I, just, I really like octopus. I don't know. But the uh, part of the reason that he's able to achieve so much in philosophy is because he, he starts at the right spot. Like he is literally starting with octopi limbs like he, he's he is very much in, uh, engrossed in the sensible and yeah. as you said he has to he has to abstract out the 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 more um or the the essences of things from that and, and again comes up with the idea of essences but he but he's very much rooted in the sensible and mm-hmm. and and derives metaphysics above the the physics that he comes from he really it, it, it of necessity has to grow out of how he understands physics 
I mean, one of the more interesting philosophical papers I've read in recent times has been David Oderberg's um, on the metaphysical status of siphonophores, which siphonophores being a marine animal, which there's great debate of whether they're one animal or a colony of animals. And then David Oderberg's like, no, I'm going to classify this. And he goes on this very thorough investigation of what it is and comes up, no, these can't be different. These are just different parts. They actually can't be metaphysically considered. Uh, different animals because of the unity they they show and so on and so forth and he goes for a classification system which has interesting uh repercussions for other areas of biology and so on but there's this very you know hands-on approach which is also at the same time completely useless knowledge for practical purposes but you know it's true <laughs> it's true knowledge <laughs> right but it's completely useless for you know what are we going to do with siphonophores scientifically can they give us anything useful in terms of medicine or whatever it's useless for those purposes but for classification and truth it's it's true it's useless okay. truth but true nonetheless and it's what it's what science has lost for the most part it's and when he, when he talks about this division is you don't have people i mean with with rare exceptions no one's trying to figure out okay is this one thing or is it, is it multiple things mm -hmm. um when you look at debates over something like abortion or mm -hmm. any other of the sort of the issues of the day that, that cut right to, you know, what is a human being? Mm -hmm. um, you know, there, we, we have well-trod methods for answering these questions and they're, they're found in, in metaphysics and they're found in Aristotle and, and St. Thomas and no one, we don't go back to them, but, mm -hmm. the, but it's, so it, it sort of ends up being this, you, that's why you get lost in this idealism. It's like, well, we can think of it this way. We can think of it this way. And it's like, no, like you said, what, what is truth? What is, what is the, what is the thing actually? Because it is something before I think it's one thing or another. And we can, yes. the, there's a, there's a, a ambition that we can actually arrive at these things that I think is lost. Um, and that I think um, Meriton was already starting to see was being lost is that people weren't trying to, trying to use metaphysics to understand the world. Yeah, it's just a word, as he says before. You know, the ancient mm -hmm. era of the nominalists is about all this wisdom. It's just a, just a word. It's a mere word. It's a verbal expression. It's nothing but that. Mm -hmm. Very and then, yeah, and then on page nine, I don't know if you have your copy. I'm not going to yep. read. I'm just going to note this. Uh, he has absolutely the most impressive footnote I've ever seen. Where <laughs> I don't know if you're seeing this. Where it's an entire page, and then it goes on and leaks on to the next page of it. And it's just, uh, I haven't read it, but it's him basically complaining about how a random French philosopher, Jean Beruzzi, ca uh, classifies the life of saints and how it's absolutely wrong and you shouldn't pay attention to him. Um, and it's, it's great, but it's not worth reading. But uh, I just make a note of this because just, just after this footnote, I have a, a few more uh, uh, underlines here. It, but it, so it, I will say it, it's the it's the 1930s equivalent of the subtweet. Like he just goes yeah. off on on <laughs> yeah, Bruzzi's really and does. and like Bruzzi has apparently has nice things to say about uh, Saint John of the Cross. And he's like, no, you're completely wrong in every way. You have undermined everything. Like he would Saint John of the Cross would think you were compl a complete idiot. He would consider you an abomination. <laughs> it's on that <laughs> level. He would abhor your description of him. He would run away from it. It's beautiful. Okay, yeah, so yeah, great. you have some other quotes after that. Yeah. So the contemplation of the saints, this is just before he's talking about this mystical union that the saints achieved. The contemplation of the saints is not the line of metaphysics. It is the line of religion. The supreme wisdom does not depend on the intellect's effort in search of the perfection of knowing, but on man's gift of his entire self in search of a perfect restitude. To, uh, rectitude in respect to his end capital uh, capitalized it has nothing to do with the stultification which pascal advised the proud to cultivate if it is there it is because pride has already fallen rather it knows so well that it no longer dreams of knowing this highest kind of knowing supposes that knowing has been forgone so this is essentially the essence of a contemplative life to the christian mystic or to the christian monk it's the supreme union that can't really be expressed. It's, uh, you know, it's very well encapsulated by Aquinas himself, where after receiving the beatific vision in a dream, he says, oh, my work is straw. I don't, you know, I can't, I can't express this. So he stopped writing mm -hmm. and in, he never, he, he never finished the Summa. Just one more short quote. The saints do not contemplate to know, but to love. They do not love for the sake of, for the sake of loving, but for the love of him whom they love him being capitalized it is the love of their first beloved god that they aspire to that very union with god the love demands whilst they love themselves only for him 
For that, for them, the end of ends is not to bring exaltation to their intellect and nature and thus stop it themselves. It is to do the will of another, capitalized, to contribute so to the good of the good, capitalized. They do not seek their own soul. They lose it. They no longer possess it. If in entering into the mystery of divine filiation and becoming something of God, they gain a transcendent personality, an independence and a liberty which nothing in the world approaches, it is by forgetting all else so that they do not live, but the, but the beloved, capitalized, lives in them. Beautiful. There's the, absolutely. There's this this sense, and, and you you mention it with um with the uh, that vision that that Aquinas experiences. But there's this real idea that you sort of have to abandon, not maybe abandon is the wrong word, but that but that um, the intellect sort of becomes useless at some point in trying to and trying to reach these peaks that the contemplative life can lead you to. Yeah, in um, a sense, you, you don't abandon your intellect necessarily because it's saved there by Christ, it's sure. remembered by Christ, but you abandon yourself. You know, he who yes. he who clings to his life will lose it. He who loses his life will gain it. Where, which he really actually quotes here, you know, uh, mm -hmm. they, they do not seek their own soul. They lose it. They no longer possess it. It is not their, it's, it's not my will be done. It's your will be done. Right. But that there's, there's a, there's this, this humility of their own intellect that they can just be subsumed by, by the divine will and by love of the divine will. And, um, they 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 sort of embrace. I'm trying. You you probably have the quote that I and I won't. But the the they embrace this sort of this night of ignorance that is where they they are uh, directly confronted with with a, a wisdom that is that sort of surpasses their understanding. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's some. Yeah. There's a another good uh, explanation of this. Uh, for there is in for here there is a God who is not a name. So again, back to the nomalists, but a reality. There is a real capitalized and indeed a super real, both capitalized, which first exists before us and without us. One that is capable of being grasped, neither humanely nor angelically, but divinely, and one who makes us divine for that very purpose. A super spirit, the attaining of whom does not limit us, but removes the limits from our finite spirit. You, the living God, our creator. Before discussing mysticism, there is a question, John Brown, that you must first answer. Has your Peter Morhange been created? So before you even enter into mystical life, you have to sort of answer, is there a God? Have you been created? John Brown, I believe, was a mystic of the time. I'm not sure. He has absolutely no footnotes for this explanation. He just sort of froze us out there. I assume John Brown was a mystic and Peter Morhange was ever... Uh, a character or the uh, or you know the other way around in verse relation i assume this is an, another note that uh that Mariton makes in the foreword where he's like he mentions like writing in the french style he is extremely loose with his citations and his references because that the french just don't care enough to have any kind of standardization oh yeah i mean if you read camus his uh big non-fiction work is uh l'homme hebel the rebel uh and it's i really like it it's a very good history of, of the philosophy of rebellion from uh essentially starting from the French Revolution, going to the Russian nihilists, and finally to uh, the fascists and the Nazis. It's a very good uh, description of that uh, from a sort of very neutral standpoint for the most part, uh, sort of analyzing it and its disastrous consequences. But uh, he has no fucking, he has like five citations in that book. And he will just casually make sort of extreme claims, like Aristotle believed that history is cyclical. And that, you know, the siege of Troy would happen again or had not yet happened. And I'm not sure if that's true, but uh, <laughs> I can't confirm because he doesn't say where he read it or where he believes this. And I'm almost inclined, like, he was trained in the classics and his dissertation is on Platonism, Neoplatonism, and the church fathers. So I assume a lot of his, like, work is correct, but I can't know because he doesn't cite any of it. The, the yes, French style is, is that meme of like source. Like I saw it in a dream. Yeah, it kind of is. It's just like you kind of just have to take his word for it. And it's I didn't know that was the French style. I thought there was a commu thing, and then I started reading other French offers, and it's like, oh, they all kind of do this. Okay, interesting. So there's a there's a great point when he's when he's talking about um, the the differences between intellectual knowledge of, and metaphysics and the and and the knowledge that comes from from divine contemplation. And I, and I, I, I can't think about it in a footnote, but it's really okay. How does how does one sort of which has supremacy? And there's this very nice idea that he he, he puts very succinctly um, that 
you know, because we are prone to error and there's a, a part earlier, we talked very much about like, you know, that we are, we try and, you know, use reason to find things, but not only can we, is that limited, but we're really bad at reasoning. Like we're going yes. to screw up over and over and over again. So we can't use that as our basis to say, okay, we have this, we have this wonderful mystic who is, who is living the, the, the contemplative life um, as an exemplar, but you know, how do we, do we, do we criticize him and say, well, you know, the logic would tell us this. And he says, no, it's the other way around is, is our, we, we verify or validate our, our, our reason by the, the revelation given to the, the saints, but the, the, what, what mystics can, can teach us because their knowledge is, is far beyond what we are capable of, mm -hmm. even though we, we do, it's, it's, we, we have to take it by faith that they are, that they are correct when in their, in their thinking. Yes. And there is a sort of, uh, there's a very, you know, this is sort of a starting point, but there, there's interesting stuff that Peter Geach talks about this a bit because he's an English analytic Catholic philosopher. But he sort, sort of talks about faith as this relationship of trust and that it's not a an irrational relationship of trust because it's just because, of, you know, there's this whole argument of the way things seem can be a reasonable way to interpret things and you don't really need final conclusive evidence. But, you know, Peter Geach has this interesting example of, you know, if you're stranded in the woods and you you're hurt and it's at night and you you don't know you don't don't know if there's anyone nearby it's not stupid to call for help you know it's in in the same way it's not stupid to call for help to god even if you have doubts or questions or you can't feel his presence but this is sort of a you know that's a prelude to trust in a way and then there's a moment in your life uh, at least in my experience in my personal experience and that you gain that trust uh at a critical point usually and there's sort of a no walking back from it. So even if for some somehow, you know, um, someone disproved the five ways to me, I would say, OK, I can't say where your logic is wrong, but I know it's wrong somewhere. Peter Geach also, I think, has this. He explicitly says this, like, don't don't worry about apologetics that much. The, the, fa the failure in logic is in there somewhere. Don't worry about it. It's fine. And he's this, you know, he's one of the 20th century's greatest logicians. And he's right. like, it's fine. Don't worry about it. It's you, sooner, even if your intellect isn't capable of it, someone will discover it sooner or later. It's it's okay. <laughs> nice. Um, let's see, where are we picking up now? Uh, oh, let me see. Phil, Phil, Phil. So the next thing I had, um, and if you guys learned before this, but there's a, another thing. I'm on, I'm on page 12. Where he says, finally, sure, the contemplation of the saints. Go right. on. Um, finally, the contemplation of the saints is not only for divine love, it is also through it. Yes. Uh, it not only supposes the theological virtue of faith, but the theological virtue of charity and the infused gifts of understanding, capital U, and wisdom, capital W, as well. And these do not exist in the soul without charity. Love as such attains immediately and in himself, capital H, the very God attained in faith in an obscure manner and as it were at a distance. This is so because as far as understanding is concerned, there is distance when there is not vision, while love unites us in our heart to him who is hidden in faith. Mm -hmm. Yes. There, yeah, yeah, yeah. Fi finally found the page. Okay, good. <laughs> but the um, it's, and I, and I think we, we sort of touched on this in an oblique way when we were again talking about sort of the, the, the physical fruits of the church, mm -hmm. but that the, the con contemplative, contemplative life lends itself or, or, or is, uh, necessitates charity and love as you, you can't have contemplation without, without real charity and without, yeah. without, without this, this connection to the physical in, in the paragraph before he sort of mentions this, this, um, uh, the, the, the contemplative life is, is more like an inactivity in death because of being supernatural, not only in its object, but also in its very way of proceeding, it emanates from our spirit moved by God alone and depends on operative grace in which the whole initiative belongs to God is that you were, you were so given over to mm -hmm. God that you were, you have sort of not, not lost your humanity, but it has been subsumed in the divine, mm -hmm. but that there, but there is still this, this necessity, this, the virtue of charity, um, um, is supposed by, by faith and the, and the contemplation of the saints. Well, yeah. These are gifts of grace. Uh, and the inf yeah, the infused gifts of understanding and wisdom, these do not exist in the soul without charity. But it, I f it's very interesting to see a philosopher just outright say, yeah, there is infused gift. There is a charism of understanding and wisdom that is just given to you by God if you just pray really hard. <laughs> that just happens. And it's very, it's very weird, I think, for a 21st century mind to see a very serious philosopher just say this mm -hmm. very casually. 
you know, as sort of a, it's not obvious because he needs to spell it out, but you know, once he spells it out, it becomes obvious. I remember a, a discussion or a, it was sort of a, a, not quite a rhetorical question, but a, a, a friend of mine who was um, very steeped in Thomism, but he was trying to talk to other Catholics about the idea of grace. And, and his sort of question to them was, okay, you know, if, if does grace Im- like make you better at your job? Does grace Im- improve your ability to, you know, if you're, if you're a, a scientist, do you, do you, you know, are you going to do better science? If you're a mechanic, are you going to do better things? And the sort of the, the general um, perspective is no, you know, grace doesn't actually affect your, your actual life. You know, grace doesn't do anything for you. And it's, and, and like you said, Maritain is very clear, like, okay, you know, grace gives you things. Grace, grace makes mm-hmm. you more, it, it, it perfects your nature. And that includes your physical nature. It includes the the way you interact with the world. It's not it's not this woo woo. It's not distinct from your physical mm-hmm. person or the way you interact with the world. It is a it is a real perfection of your nature. Even if God didn't infuse to you the gift of understanding mechanical parts of of automotives, you know you're probably better at dealing with customers at your mechanic shop through the gift of charity than otherwise, mm-hmm. and so on. If nothing else, you're certainly you're certainly not made worse off, and it's and yes, all, it, all it can do is improve you. Yes, all it can do is yeah. Grace will never make you worse off. It can make you worse off materially. You might be hounded or persecuted or martyred, but it cannot make you worse off in the sense mm-hmm. of privations, in the moral sense certainly, and in the sense of you know being not just moral but metaphysically you yes, are more. Yes, it, it, it makes it makes you more what you are. It, 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 mm-hmm. it's, it yeah. Perf- it, perf- grace perfects nature. It, yeah, it, he has this quote, not in here, but in the free reformers, where the saints have so much personality because they give up all their personality to the transcendent one first personality that is God, because they give up their lives, they gain it. Again, he, that, this is a big motif in all his work in the saints, where he constantly emphasizes this, that to, to give you, to receive, you must first give, to gain your life, you must first lose it, and it's very constantly emphasized. It's actually a very good... Uh, a very good text to read Maritan to actually understand what he me- what that passage means. Mm-hmm. If you know, if you don't read church fathers or or com- Bible commentaries or stuff like that, or if the homily that week didn't touch on it, read Maritan. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, you mentioned it, but it really is just so striking to me. Is is for someone who is doing serious scholastic philosophy, that is that it is it because you'll see this and and you'll see it in in. Um, you know, someone like Phaser or some of the more moderns where they're doing metaphysics and the, you know, the, they're certainly Catholic, but it's not, it's not, it's not Catholic metaphysics, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. And in, in Maritain, the two are inseparable is because you can, yeah. you can certainly do domestic or scholastic metaphysics without Catholicism. Like I mentioned, you can be a, yeah. a secular scholastic and he is so, and, and this chapter is sort of making the case for that's never going to be enough. <laughs> yeah, he's, yeah, but yeah, he's, he's, I mean, we began with, uh, I believe, a quote from the, from the Gospels, or at the very least, very much saying, yeah, it was either Isaiah or the Gospels, I forget, but certainly a Bible quote in like the second paragraph, <laughs> just outright uh, saying, yeah, you, you know, this is the ultimate end, by the way, of, of mm-hmm. knowledge, and the, the unity of knowledge is really the is really it's implied throughout the text that you know the real you're only going to gain this if you become a monk probably but uh (laughs) but yeah that's like the real deal in a sense it's the more perfect path and that's the the brings me the next one because this was so good and this you might have this highlighted as well but the no meta no metaphysics yes yes that was what i had highlighted (laughs) i'll I'll let you you take it go for it no metaphysics is not the doorway to mystical contemplation that door is christ's humanity for by him we have been given grace and truth. I am the way, he has said of himself. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved, and he will pass inside, and he will pass outside, and he will find pasture. Having gained entrance through him, the soul climbs and penetrates the dark and bare contemplation of pure divinity, and it descends once more and goes out to the contemplation of sacred humanity and in both instances it finds pasture and is nourished by its god and the, yeah the, the, <laughs> the connection back there to the to the um the greatest commandment too is you know to love love um god the father with all your uh follow your heart soul and uh heart soul mind strength all your being heart soul and being i believe yeah. or something yes. like that and and the the second which is great is the first to love your neighbor as yourself and there's this direct comment this, this 
the the, the same theme um, repeated here is this contemplation of the divine that then comes out to to contemplate humanity. Is the, is this is to 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 know God? You have to you have to understand the 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 sacredness that is in you and your and and that you are made to for that knowledge. Mm -hmm. And through that and through and it's very much. He emphasized. I'm only really grasping this now that we're talking about it. But he he constantly emphasizes the unity of love and knowledge, all the time. He's talking about love or knowledge through love or this infused understanding of grace, and he's really talking about living a certain virtuous life. You know, he's almost going to the conclusion. Not quite. He doesn't go that far. But he's almost going to the conclusion that if a philosopher doesn't live a virtuous life, you might as well not pay attention to him. Because he's certainly not infused by grace. Like this might this was probably untrue. There's interesting things that uh, that uh, immoral people have said, but certainly it's almost a conclusion that you reach. That this person is not a saint. He hasn't achieved. He certainly hasn't achieved union of the divine. He's mm -hmm. stopped short. At some point, he has run afoul of something. Yeah. Perfect. Um... Do you have anything else in that, or should we jump on to, to seven? Uh, we can go to seven. Okay. So, and there's there's only I think what nine or ten, by the way. So we're just so people know we're getting to the end of things. I know we wanted to, mm -hmm. I wanted to try and keep this relatively brief because I'm, yeah, I'm sure and we, we already end up... covered the ending as well. Yeah, that's a good we point. We skipped that. But I, I love the idea in seven he, when he talks starts talking about um, and it, he quotes uh, Saint Thomas. Uh, it says, thus says St. Thomas, mm -hmm. when the name wise is said of man, it in some way describes and envelops the thing signified, but not so when it is said of God, for then it leaves the thing signified as it were uncontained and uncircumscribed and exceeds the signification of the name. And he's, he's talking about this idea that we, even when we try and put a name to God or say, okay, this is God, he is being, he is truth, he is goodness. We are because we only know goodness through things that the physical things that we can see and those things are not perfectly good we are always falling short of actually naming god is the we the, the signs we can make of god are always completely insufficient to to signify him mm -hmm. because we only have our experience to try and do them and they and they always as much as as um they they participate in being they always do it imperfectly so whatever whatever they have that that god has they have it in a lesser way so there's there's really no way for us to to in in the physical world to bridge that that gap between what we would call truth or being or or goodness or mm -hmm. knowledge and capital g goodness capital t truth capital b being if I can put it imagistically to viewers, because this is a hard concept to understand, and if taken to extremes, you sort of end up with William Vacham's nominalism that, you know, you can't really say anything about the divine attributes, these are mere words. But if I can put it imagistically, um, imagine that you're, in a, you're near a lake or in a lake shore, and it's at night, and you see the moon's reflection, but for some reason you can't see the moon, so the best you can do is to point at the moon's reflection on the lake. You can you cannot point at the real thing. For some reason, it's obscured. You can't see through the clouds because your eyesight is not that good um, or some other defect. Maybe it's a defect of our nature. Maybe it's because your nature isn't perfect or maybe it's just a feature of the natural world or whatever. But in this image, you can only point to the reflection of the moon. And you're pointing at something, but you're not pointing at the thing in itself you're still uh, too far away from that to be able to do so. You're not, you know, you're not planting the flag in the moon. <laughs> you're not doing a Neil Armstrong or a Buzz right. Aldrin. You can only point to the moon's reflection in this uh, image. So that's basically, that's a, the best way that I can put it imagistically. What he's trying to say here. I think it's very good, yeah. And sure. so, and unless you have something else there, we can get on to the discussion of modern times that it goes into in eight. Yeah, I'll just mention that uh, sure. the intellectual knowledge of God, in the, as he says this in the next paragraph, even though it is absolutely true, absolutely certain, and constitute an authentic wisdom, desirable love, desirable above all things, is still irreparably defective, lacking due proportion to the object done and signified in its very manner of grasping and signifying. So even in that analogy, you can sort of see the flaw in it because, you know, even if the moon is a reflection, it's sort of proportional to the image of the moon that, you mm -hmm. know, you would naturally get, even if it's distorted. So even then, even in this analogy, I fail this proportionality part. 
So even then, I can't properly analyze, make a, an image of it. I still fail at that because obviously God's uh, God's proportion cannot be grasped imagistically. <laughs> right. So we can go to eight now. Sure, but I, I, and I'll say this: this again, and and it it flows through very well. And and on, on first reading, it's hard to get. You really have to go through this like a number of times. Yes. But it is all it is all tying through the idea. I think in the name of the chapter was the majesty and poverty of metaphysics. And that sums mm -hmm. it up very well. Is even in our in our ability to in our in our language in our thoughts, this this poverty in our ability to to grasp the divine. He said, you know, short of the the beatific vision, will always fall short. But mm -hmm. the, but the, it, it induces this longing because you know, like you said, you can you can see the reflection of the moon and you can see that it is something amazing, and all you can do is look at the water and mm -hmm. and have some idea that there is something greater that is you know you realize its reflection. Um, but all, but all you can do is see the water. Yeah. To put it negatively, if you, uh, if you believe that, uh, you know, that you when we say wise, it does envelop God. If you do believe that to put it in a negative image, it's sort of like the man who sees a signpost pointing forward and climbs up the signpost because he, you know, <laughs> it's pointing upwards. That's sort of right. it. You're getting it. You're not really getting what we're pointing to. Yes. Yeah, you you've grasped something of it, but you've you've missed uh you've missed sort of the point. Yeah, that's, that's, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, that's sort of yeah, that's the by negative way of putting it. If you take it uh it's true, it, you know, you're supposed to go forward and in the sense, you know, it's true that uh, it looks like you're supposed to go up from that signpost, mm -hmm. but uh that's not really what the signpost is trying to say. It's trying to communicate something that it can't communicate in the way it's laid out you you sort of have to take it as a metaphor or figuratively mm -hmm. so in the in the next part maritain starts getting into and I, I think i get the impression very much and not without without reason uh maritain despaired a little bit of what he saw in the 20th century and talks about this he calls, calls it this disjunction between flesh and spirit uh progressive mm -hmm. dislocation of the shape of human things is that we've really in the in the advancement of science and in the in the um, the sort of the progress of the day, we have separated metaphysics from its from its role in understanding the world. As we no longer mm -hmm. have to talk about, um, you know, we, we don't have the the discussions of whether or not random marine creatures are one thing or several things. Mm -hmm. We have you know we have taxonomy, we have nominalism. We say okay, yep, it's this or it's this. And we start trying to to write formula or give symbolic um, interpretations of what it does, and you know, okay, what rate does it reproduce at? And it becomes very quantitative mm -hmm. and becomes very distant from from the essence of the thing or from being itself. Mm -hmm. um, and he's, he he points to this sort of positive aspect of this. Okay, we don't need to if metaphysics doesn't need to do that. Well, it can it can focus on the bigger things. Yeah, he sort um, of that's a very funny thing. Where it's like where he's I remember he takes a there's a positive outlook. It's like okay, metaphysics has sort of been purified. It doesn't need to do these things. Good, we have practical science. But uh, there's also this other problem that has been raised. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't and, know if you agree, but the best part of this chapter to me was the footnote. You go on with what you said. Was the foot, footnote one was easily the best part of uh, part eight? You'll have yeah. to so jump into that afterwards. But what yeah. I was I would just point out because I, I and I think he will get into this, and if not, I will certainly hammer on it when we get into it. Uh -huh. is, but what the what the practical sciences lose without metaphysics is that because they they no longer have it, and because you know in, in the natural progression of things, the sciences build from from the base, like we were talking with Aristotle. You know, you sort of you do your your biology, you look at your octopi. You abstract um, ideas from those. You understand essences from those. You understand more pure essences. You start understanding, trying to comprehend in some limited way the divine. Mm -hmm. And if you if you sever those two things, if metaphysics is no longer no longer the 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 end of your science, but its own sort of separate thing, then your sciences no longer have their proper end, and they and they become for their own sake. Whereas you know metaphysics, you were doing for its own sake. Ultimately, the sciences you should be doing for the sake of metaphysics, right? The, the, mm -hmm. the, the highest sense, we yes. can, the, the highest end that we can we can aim to achieve is is our end, is capital E N, um, is the is the end of of being united with with truth. And if you are doing science without that end, it sort of has to find its own end. It becomes an end in itself, and it loses that grounding or that connection to what it actually moves us towards towards our full completion mm -hmm. and i think it's a, it is a it is a, a loss for the sciences that they no longer there is no longer a sense of trying to connect of trying to connect the the practical sciences to 
to being or to an understanding, even even at the at the sort of lower metaphysical level of saying, you know, okay, what what is what is a single creature? What is a single substance? And what is a colony of of things? In losing that, you no longer have an end for the practical sciences, and then so they can mm -hmm. do all they can wreck all kinds of havoc because they can still that you know they they have the tools now as of as of you know like I said um, Newton or or Descartes or or Maxwell or whoever else you you have all this ability to do impressive things, but it's done aimlessly either either consciously or, or unconsciously. It's, it's it no longer is is oriented towards towards truth. In the, in the ultimate sense and i think i think that has severely damaged science and it's and what it means for us in the last 150 200 years mm -hmm. and he goes into this in the footnote I, I mentioned go for it okay so it's a it's a paragraph of a footnote so it's a bit long uh but here goes material techniques of themselves should be should have prepared the way for a life much more completely freed of matter but in virtue of man's fault, they actually tend to oppress spirituality. Does that mean that technique must be forsaken or that we must give ourselves up to vain regrets? That has never been our view. But in this case, reason has to impose its human regulation. And if it succeeds in this without having, recourse, without having to have recourse to purely despotic and for quite other reasons in human solutions, the, mater the materialization of which we have been speaking would have, be would have been overcome, at least for a time anyway. We are not making any claim here to express the law of a necessary curve in events. We are merely trying to sift out from the point of time in which we now exist the significance of a tendency in the form of a curve which these have followed down to the present moment and a tendency that human liberty can rectify. So he's saying that it's not necessary that, ma that material technique you know, has, you know, removed spirituality from our lives. It's just a tendency that's happening at the moment, and it's a tendency that human liberty can rectify. As he mentions earlier in the chapter, it's true that uh, that the, the modern mind is not suited for metaphysics, for metaphysics, but that's second nature. First nature is always there. The syllogism will last as long as man does, and habits can be corrected. And the end of this part as well, he has this beautiful anecdote of, uh, you know, of the destiny of the church if Christendom falls, basically. <laughs> right. Which is, although the Christendom of days gone has been undone, yet Christ's church has continued to rise. It too has been set free little by little and delivered the care for civil communities that rejected from a temporal providence at once exercised in accordance with its right to heal our wounds. Despoiled, stripped of everything, when she flees into a solitude, she will take with her all that remains in the world, not only of faith and charity and true contemplation, but of philosophy, poetry, and virtue. And all these will be more beautiful than ever. This is the the Catholic Thomas version of a white pill. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, essentially, it's essentially the world will pass away, but my words, but, but my words will not put into French poetry for metaphysics. Mm -hmm. That's essentially what it's that it's that uh, it's that it's that quote well, Lord, uh, put into a paragraph by a French poet metaphysician, <laughs> essentially. And it's it's. Because I, so much I think of the subject matter is rather despondent, but his tone is so hopeful because he, I mean, he, he again is a, is a very good Catholic and has yeah. absolute faith in the, in the, um, in the indomitability of the church. Then it's okay. Yeah. You know, what, or Europe, Europe can fall. The West can fall. We can screw everything up and the church will, you know, whatever's, whatever's worth saving and keeping the church will hold on to it and it will be around mm -hmm. for as long as it needs to be and it'll be all right. And, you know, it's a very interesting to contrast this with Tolkien's view, because Tolkien uh, is very much a pessimist, at least in uh, as it appears in Lord of the Rings. He's like, mm -hmm. yeah, things will be will probably get progressively worse and worse. The elves will leave. And, uh, you know, evil, we can stop staunch it for a while and then it'll come back again and again and again. And it will get worse and worse and worse until the final battle and then we'll win. And so it'll be good. <laughs> it'll be fine. <laughs> uh, and he also has the concept of the you catastrophe. Uh, you being good in Greek and catastrophe being the turning moment, the turning point in a mm -hmm. story. Uh, and so that would be, you know, in a sense, Smeagol is the you catastrophe that they wouldn't have been able to destroy the ring without a Smeagol's interference of Frodo. Uh, there is a catastrophe that even evil itself cannot, it cannot resist but to destroy itself in the final moment and when the chips are down. 
And so it's this very interesting uh, co this, this very interesting co correlation between the French and the English side of Catholic of the Catholic world, where you know Maritain will write this metaphysical treatise filled with you know hope that even if everything goes to hell, you know it will be fine because we'll still this church will still be there. And for Tolkien, you know, we'll suffer defeats and defeats and defeats, but it'll be fine because the final battle will win. So it's okay. So just keep fighting. Yeah, there's a, a quote later on. I was I was trying to find this. Um, if this is at the bottom of seventeen, if you're in your uh, copy, uh, if European culture comes to the brink of danger, she, meaning the church, will save its essentials and will know how to lift up to Christ everything that can be saved in other mm -hmm. cultures. I she hears rumbling at the roots of history, an unforeseen world, a world that will undoubtedly persecute her as much as the ancient world did. Is not her mission a mission of suffering? But she will find in it new possibilities of action. Mm -hmm. it's, it, I mean, it's it's the it's this very Catholic kind of hopefulness is we are going mm -hmm. to, we're going to the church will will have to work. It will be hard. It will suffer. It will be persecuted, and we will win. And we are we are winning even now. And I will actually read the just a prelude to this. Uh, though, because I underlined this whole section a bit before this, sure. though baptized nations unfaithful to their calling cut themselves off from the church. Blaspheme the name of Christ on all sides by presenting as a Christian civilization what is nothing but its corpse. The church still loves those nations. She has no need of them. They are the ones that need the church. It is for their welfare that the church, by using the only culture in which human reason very nearly succeeded, has tried for so long to impress a divine form on earthly matter, to raise man's life and reason, and so to maintain them in their perfection under the most gentle sway of grace. And then we enter that section you just quoted. Oh, it's so good. And it's so, it's, <laughs> it's got this... There's this sort of air of that very like austere bishop that is just like knows that the that he is an absolute authority in what he says, and that you will either go with him or you will be wrong. And it's mm -hmm. like yeah, there's there is the 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 church is is doing what it's supposed to do. She is she is making herself perfect, the the perfect bride for Christ, mm -hmm. and you are going along with it or you are screwing it up, and we will we will you know. Pray for your for your uh, <laughs> yeah. Conversion. We'll pray for your soul. <laughs> we but still yeah. We're, unfaithful. We're still doing our thing. And we're like blaspheme yeah. Christ. We still love you. By the way, <laughs> you suck though. <laughs> Bla and blaspheme Christ. God, what is it? Um, oh, how am I losing this already? But blaspheme Christ by yeah presenting, presenting as a Christ Christian civilization that which is nothing but its corpse. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> The church still loves those nations. We love you, buddy. You suck, by the way. <laughs> it's great. It's, he's such a good, he's such an entertaining writer. Mm -hmm. Even if you don't understand the metaphysics, even just reading him, like it's worth it for these moments. Because these are often, these are not just, you know, spread every now and then. This happens often throughout the text that you'll hell have these moments. So even if you get confused a bit, it's almost worth reading him just for this. I agree. I agree. I think what Caleb was, we were talking to Caleb earlier and he said he's going to try and do this in the original French. And I think he's insane because I think the no, translation works crazy. very well. But it's, I, I can only imagine if you were, because again, uh, Merton was a native French speaker. It probably, it probably is better in the native, in the, in the, uh, in French, if you were proficient in the tongue, but God, I can't imagine trying to, trying I to struggle. Imagine, if you, yeah. yeah. I can't. Yeah. Unless you're proficient in the tongue, uh, don't, 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 do not attempt this at home. <laughs> basically uh but yeah this, this also calls to mind my favorite catholic song which is i'm just a dog by the hillbilly thomists which as the, the line in the midst of his desiccation there is i still see potential for action and there's there is sort of a play on you know the, <laughs> the thomistic aristotelian distinction between potency and act i think but mm -hmm. there is but very much it's like okay everything has gone to shit but you know i still see potential for action and uh if they very much play on the motif of Dominicans as the, the dog with a torch in its mouth that came from St. Dominic's dream of what he should do. Uh, you know, the, the Dominicanis, which is a, constant, a common pun on their name, the dog, the hounds of God, as Chesterton called them. Mm -hmm. And then there's that quote we read, which is uh, if, if, if uh, Hilaire, the whole Hilaire Belloc uh, speech... Yeah, and then and then he sort of concludes um, the chapter again. So he's he's raised some some more somber notes, 
And I, mm -hmm. and I, I love this. He says, I will never scorn with the distress nor the waiting of those who feel that all is lost and mm -hmm. await the unexpected. And there's, and, um, and later on, there is a difference between not knowing what one hopes for and knowing that the thing one hopes for cannot be conceived. Talking about the the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Mm -hmm. It's a there is a we know that we know what we are waiting for and that it surpasses all understanding. Yes, <laughs> we are waiting <laughs> for this and we we do not. We, we, we know what we're waiting for and we know we do not conceive it in any coherent and the way. Next two paragraphs, which are just a quote of uh, from a. Uh, I believe the life, the life of a, it's a very early church passage from uh, the life of the early martyrs, I think, mm -hmm. which might be worth reading in full. I don't know if you want to do it or should, I should do it. Go right ahead and we can conclude on that because sure. it's the end of the chapter. Yeah, because it's the end. Perfect. So this is all a quote. Adrian, while still a pagan, asked the martyrs, for what reward do you hope? They replied, our mouth cannot speak it, nor our ear hear it. And so you have learned nothing of it, neither by the law nor the prophets, nor any other writing. The prophets themselves did not know it as it should be known, for they were only men who adored God, and they have told in words the things they received from the Holy Ghost. But concerning that glory, it is written, eye has not seen, nor ear heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man what the Lord has prepared for those who love him. On hearing that, Adrian immediately, immediately jumped down into their midst and said, Count me among those, the, those who confess the faith with these saints, for behold, I too am a Christian. <laughs> oh. And again, just, just summing together, and this is this is the 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 connection he makes again and is and is infused through this chapter, the that we we with uh with the the grasping that intellectual knowledge leads us to that it's completed by faith is so beyond our understanding but is so um it, when infused properly with grace and love and charity is is beyond all telling and it's it is it is so optimistic despite the i mean just like we've been talking about despite the 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 suffering and the and the battles that have to be waged and the and the um short term in the in the sort of greatest sense despair that there that there is this great hope and faith that is that should be unshakable and that you have you mentioned earlier the sort of the the um um uh, apologetic argument just from from observing those of great faith yeah from and the think, witness of the, of the faithful mm -hmm. and i think nothing summarizes that more than again the, the early church martyrs Mm -hmm. Yeah, very much so. I mean, this this is not a rare occurrence where the executioner joins in after asking a few questions. <laughs> <laughs> it's really it happens all the time, which is just very. I mean, our the most important saint of the second half of the New Testament, Saint Paul, is was pretty much an executioner for right. quite a. I mean, just the worst guy around, and you know he turned his life around after after a vision. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of, you know, that's part of the Christian hope and the, and the hope of evangelization, but you know, he can't, but that's sort of, that's sort of the whole story of the early church and, you know, of Christianity in general, it's the story of redemption, even for the executioners. Love it. Okay. Um, that's chapter one. I think we, we ran on a little bit. I'm hoping yeah, that's this is the shortest chapter, I think. Yeah. We're going <laughs> to, we're, we're going to have to tighten this up if we're going to get through this by yeah. 2024. Um, At the next ones, I think I'll uh, I'll like try to summarize the main arguments and underline the more beautiful, uh, more important passages. I'll skip the just on the beautiful because if it's beautiful, I'll underline every other fucking line. So uh, <laughs> I'll try to just stick to the argument and like the really important passages. Perfect. Hope this is interesting for everyone. We're gonna keep doing it regardless as, as long as I can keep you showing up. I'm because I really want to get through this because I love it. I'm mm -hmm. hoping this is interesting for people that are that are following along. Um, it's you know, one chapter and I think it's worth picking up, but if you, if you don't want to, to it's, as I said, it's, it's a bit of a, it's not a slog. It's, a, it is an enjoyable read, but it is a, it is a difficult one. It is a challenging mm -hmm. read. So if you just want to follow along with us, happy to have you. Um, we're going to keep doing it. Uh, Bulge, what, you got anything else you want to say? Any plugs, any conclusions? Uh, just, uh, also on the rec, I recommend this to everyone if you found this interesting, uh, but uh, yeah, I'd say it's, it's a difficult read in the sense that, you know, imagine you're climbing a mountain. It's very hard, but there's a lot of beautiful sights along the way, and it's very much worth it. 
but it is a it is difficult you know your your knees and your thighs will strain at certain points but just keep going with it i promise the peak is worth it that's it that's my conclusion want to do your plugs and we'll get out of here uh sure i'm at available username on twitter you'll probably never learn how i spell it unless i put it in my username but it's too late for that uh so just look try to find me on twitter if you can i write for ostrotomism i'm probably gonna finish uh, my next article tomorrow morning i'll see if i can edit it and get it uploaded by monday uh and that's about it for plugs uh for me that's you can just find me on twitter if you want and write for ostrotomism that's about it perfect um excited you're gonna get something out it's been a little while for yeah, yeah. Of I've been worse than you have. Um, I'm at <laughs> Einkath on Twitter, uh, anarchocatholic.substack.com. I also, in theory, write for ostrotomism. I have got an article that I'm working on that I think is going to be a banger on materialism, and I mm -hmm. don't know when I'm going to be able to finish it. I think with the with the holidays coming up, I'll have a little bit more time to write, but I'll also have more time that I'm expected to spend with family, which I love yep. doing. But it's a mm -hmm. it's quite it, the when you're uh, when you're a dad with young kids, the you're always needed for something. So. Mm -hmm. um, it might be a lot of late nights finishing things and I might need you guys to try and poke me and encourage me because I'm loving yeah. writing it, but it's, it's going to take a while. Um, but keep an eye out for that. It'll go up on AT and it will also go on my sub stack. Um, yeah, we're going to just sort of, I think we should just take over this channel and just start doing things without Caleb all the time. It's been great. Yeah. Yeah, it uh, has. Indeed it has. <laughs> um, please let us, let us know if you uh, watch and comment, if we're much better than Caleb or just a little bit better than Caleb. And, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, please, please comment. We'll make a Twitter poll after this. Yes, absolutely. That's part. Yeah, that's a great idea. I'm gonna go ahead and get it set up. I'm gonna see if I can, we can see if we can get. I, I think I've got the the login details for the Austrianism Twitter account, so we can put that up without Caleb, without Caleb getting in the way. Yeah. Okay. So you do it then. I was just gonna do it in my account, but that's fine. If, you do. It. I'll, I'll check and see if I can get in. He might. He might be listening. He might change the password. We gotta go quick. All right. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Um, love y'all, and we're out. Yep.